Last week, Nick gave away all our tips on how to get the best possible deal when buying a boat. But we want to be balanced. We want to help all you sellers out too. Actually, no, these will be some more buying tips. But here's the secret to getting that buyer to pay as much as possible for the boat. Forget about installing that new autopilot or radar. This is what you need to get the most money for your boat. Clean, clean, and then clean some more. And if you're really lucky, you'll get a newbie like we were 17 years ago. You know, honey, I think to really illustrate our point, we're gonna have to jump into the time machine and go way, way back to the beginning. And you know what that calls for, don't you? Popcorn! On Clarity, we take popcorn making very, very seriously. And we have perfected it to an art. Final shake, let all the steam out, and then let it sit. That's the key, to let it sit. Five minutes, would you say? Yeah. The other key is I make my own ghee. And then we heat this up. The other thing we do is we add large flake nutritional yeast in addition to garlic powder and onion powder and of course some salt and this makes the best popcorn so i guess we got to start from the very beginning should you give them a little bit of backstory i just realized it was 20 years ago that you said hey let's buy a boat <laughs> and this is it and it made sense you grew up sailing i grew up sailing but yeah. i had never been sailing which is hard to believe look at that hairdo oh my god <laughs> look at that hairdo <laughs> oh my god you're just a baby i'm such a child so this is 20 years ago so i'm like mid 20s 25 26. look at those well manicured <laughs> eyebrows so everybody this is a merit 25 uh, it's like a J24, it's about 3,000 pounds. We lived on the San Francisco Bay, and uh, hey, why not have a boat? You would never sail before, but yeah. let's buy a boat. Yeah, I love the water. And if you don't know it, the San Francisco Bay is rather windy. And uh, so it was trial by fire for you. Yeah, it was, and we started out out of Brisbane. Mm -hmm. which was kind of protected from the Golden Gate. Mm -hmm. And I remember, was, you know, we'd go out and it'd be pretty calm. And then we'd round that corner <laughs> <laughs> and the gush of wind under the Golden Gate would just lay us over. And you were never worried, you know, no, which no. was good, but it was, it was definitely a little frightening for me. Well, I grew up sailing like this on my uncle's race boat, my grandfather's race boat. And I was used to heeling over and having the uh, rail dipped under and getting kind of wet and having a good time and um so after a couple of years of owning that boat i don't know where the idea well i know where the idea occurred to me there was this magazine called latitude 38 and i think it's still around in an online form but it is the west coast sailing rag and it's all about cruising around the world and it kind of lit the fire for me uh, I could see that other people were doing it, and at that point there was no YouTube, there's no Facebook. They were just sending their stories into this magazine and it lit the fire, and I, I don't know if I went about it the right way. In fact, I went about it the wrong way with you. I said, honey, let's go get a boat. But Sail around the world. Let's go sail yeah, around the world. Yeah, you went all in. <laughs> let's go for it. Uh, these are the boats we're looking at, and what was really obvious when I was just looking at this footage again, we had no idea what we we're looking but for. But I wanted that catamaran. You did. You you were smart. You said, I want that Gemini. <laughs> I said, no, no, no. We need a big monohull. That's what you go world cruising in. Oh, there she is. I don't know. How long were we looking for? Oh, God. It's hard to remember now. At least maybe a six months, nine months. Yeah. I think we we're looking pretty hard. And it was great being in the bay. You didn't have to go far. You could see tons and tons of boats. And most of these boats were funky. They had been put away wet, they were moldy, they were kind of gross looking. And this one named Itana was the first one where we rolled up on it and it really looked like the pictures. Don't yeah. you agree? I mean, all this beautiful woodwork. All the canvas. The canvas was brand spanking new, it was all crispy and 
Oh. Down below, the, yeah, it was just like a, it was a beautiful wooden apartment. It really was. It was it, it was really in decent shape. Uh, the woodwork was had been freshly varnished, and we were swept off our feet. I, yeah. I mean, I think. I mean, look how clean it looks. Oh, and a huge cockpit. Huge cockpit. And a separate aft cabin with its own entrance. And after looking at all these. I guess junkier boats, some of which were, were pretty well outfitted. We saw this one, and it had just come up from Mexico. They said, and we were wowed. So this, this Peterson Forty Six, or I should say Cheaterson Forty Six, <laughs> it's a Formosa Peterson Forty Six. This is what we made an offer on. They were asking, <laughs> I think they were asking one hundred and twenty-five thousand, and we made our offer at one hundred and twenty thousand. And they probably just smiled at each other and said, gotcha. Because a boat like this, we later found out, if it was in moderate condition, was worth maybe sixty-five or $70,000. This one was in good condition, but it was more worth uh, like 90000 bucks, not one hundred and twenty. Survey, I don't remember anything really coming back wrong on the survey, do you? No. But what the surveyor really failed to mention was there was hardly any cruising gear on this. Here's a little side note, too. <laughs> uh, this is the former owner, thank God I don't remember her name. Uh, she said that we could take delivery of the boat offshore, meaning three miles out from San Francisco, and then we wouldn't be liable for sales tax. Okay, sure, we're so naive. We don't know anything at this point. That sounds reasonable. I think maybe, I mean, you could barely even Google anything at the time. Oh, yeah. You couldn't really research stuff. So we do this, quote, offshore delivery. And fast forward about 10 months, 11 months. Oh, the IRS came. <laughs> no, it was California something or other. Yeah, state they, border. They wanted their 15,000 oh. bucks for our purchase. Now, this was our first bottom job, not long after we bought it, and this is where I kind of started to realize that maybe she wasn't in quite as good a condition as I thought. Do you notice anything about the bottom here? This is not long after we surveyed her. Um, How about the multiple colors that yeah, are coming I'm through? Yeah, I'm looking at that. Like, the paint is white. just falling off the boat. So the bottom was just a mess. And this was the first indication that maybe everything underneath the paint and underneath those canvas covers wasn't quite so, hmm, spiffy. Yeah, look at, at, look at the paint. I know you can't see it right there. There you go. Look at that just coming right off. <laughs> yeah, that's the radar <laughs> pole and it's just, it's corroded. You take the covers off the engines and they're not brand new. The canvas is brand new. But the outboards are old, and I, I just love that that outboard hoist that they've got. <laughs> uh, what they'd done is they had painted this boat up pretty nice. Oh, here, this is great too. This is the generator. They made a nice generator cover to cover up their, you know, two hundred dollar generator. Uh, as soon as you dug in to like the batteries, look at these. They're just a complete mess. <laughs> so we were wowed by the clean cleanliness of this boat and the clean paint, but really all the systems that they had worked on really were very much amateur. Yeah. Another issue that we realized, uh, and I don't want to ramble too much, was that some of the things that were okay on our little boat, like non-self-tailing winches, are not okay on a cruising I boat. I can't believe they had that. I can't believe it either. So you say, okay, well, you can maybe do without it. We <laughs> sea trialed the boat extensively in San Francisco Bay, and for a double-handed boat, you need self-tailing oh winches. Oh my God, what were they just cleaning these off? Uh-huh. That's so clean. crazy. So that was another 10 grand. Yeah. And another 10 grand. And it just kept adding up. Is this where we add um, that I got a job at West Marine? Yes, yes. <laughs> this is an important point to our little story. So. After a while, we were illegally living aboard the boat in Emory Cove Marina, and we got found out. That's a different story. It's a pretty good story. I don't want to get into it here because we're talking about you know, selling your boat for the most money. 
But uh, we moved up to this little... I mean, it's it's like a garden shed. We really. should tell that story on the podcast. Uh-huh. Subscribe yeah, this to the little, podcast. Okay, so this little cabin was 150 square feet. It had a little loft for the bed and everything you needed. It was like just a little bit of a bigger boat and yeah. it overlooked the entire bay, the Golden Gate, the Bay Bridge. It took a while to get up there in the Oakland Hills, but it was really sweet. Yeah, and you know, as we began to realize that this boat that we bought really needed a lot more money and a lot more work than we were expecting. I don't think we were bummed out. We really, we had that spirit of adventure. Yeah. We were really just all in with this and we did everything. Can you explain <laughs> this? Looks like I beat you up. I know. I felt like a battered woman here, oh, especially man. when I was working at West Marine. And I would try to explain to every customer coming through the cashier. So I have a tip for everybody. Never try to lift up the boarding ladder with a bungee cord. With a hook, right? Yeah, a hook bungee cord. I mean, I can't believe, you can kind of see on my cheek here that this is over here. That was a big indentation. Oh, I mean, man. it didn't break my bone, which was amazing because, or knock out my eye or my teeth or we, my nose. We had so many little mis, uh, oh. not misfortunes, but I mean, we, we ran into the dock you fell in once as we were docking. I mean, we were such noobs. Oh, there's the beautiful winches that we bought. Oh, so the West Marine discount yeah, yeah. was the best. Uh -huh. And I, at first when I started, I was like nervous about all the things I wanted to buy. And pretty soon, the manager was so excited to see me come into work. And I was like, <laughs> Megan, do you have, you have a big list today? And I'd be like, yeah. And they're I like, sure oh, do. good. We need it. <laughs> going to make our numbers. So we just kept spend, spend, spending on this boat. That's a new sale, by the way. Spend, spend, spend. And we needed an <laughs> arch, of course, so we could lift our dinghy up a lot easier. Solar. Yeah, so we overspent on the boat. And then we proceeded to spend another, I think, 80,000. 60, 80,000 bucks? Yeah. I don't even want to know. I think we were into it for 200. Uh huh. At least. <laughs> And yet the boat still was not worth anywhere near that. We sold it for 120. 120, and you know we we took it down to Mexico, and we basically tried to commuter cruise for a while, and eventually just sold it relatively cheap. And felt lucky that we got a buyer to buy it out of Puerto Vallarta. Yeah. So if you're looking for a deal on a boat. <laughs> Look for the broken dream. That was one of somebody's question today. Yeah. In the the email was, you know, should I go to the less desirable places? Oh, I responded to that one. Um, I said yes. I said the harder it is to get to the place, or the harder it is to work on the boat in that place, the cheaper the boat is going to be. So, yeah, head downwind. Go to Tahiti. Go to Fiji. Go to Tonga. Um, you know, the Yucatan Peninsula. Go down to Belize, Panama. The, the boat prices are going to be significantly less than Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And hire a captain to bring it back. Yeah, yeah. Captains are, you know, good captains are expensive. But, you know, if you look at what you're saving on the boat, it could really work out in your favor. So we kind of got to get to... <laughs> it looks pretty outfitted there. <laughs> it was very well outfitted here. Uh, so I guess the point or the lesson from uh, us two noobs who had some sailing experience we actually had a boat before the lesson is don't be wowed by the paint and don't listen to what the seller might have to say we this couple they said they had a bunch of experience they said the boat was outfitted to cruise and we didn't know any better we said oh really okay great it mm -hmm. sounds perfect for us you really have to know what you're doing and you have to have an expert with you by your side so that's why i guess we're recommending uh, having a buyer's broker. Did we even use? We didn't. We had, like I said, we had so many noob stories. I mean, just barely knew what the heck we were doing. This one stands out just because we recorded it on video. So, do you want to watch this? Yeah. One? So here is a one of the best stories that I'm so glad we captured <laughs> right after it happened. So, let's let this roll. And I don't know if we even need to add any commentary. Let's just let it go. We learned uh, a couple important lessons this morning. Let me tell you what the lessons are first and then I'll tell you Look what at that pudgy little face. <laughs> first of all, before you depart for the open ocean, 
try and make sure that the anchor is attached to the boat. If it's not, it's not going to stay on the boat. Don't hope it's going to stay on the boat. Plan that it's going to try and get off the boat. And our anchor indeed tried to get off the boat. Second lesson is you have the, uh, a piece of equipment on board called a windlass. It's used for retrieving the anchor when it's time to depart or for any other reason you need to bring the anchor up back onto the boat. When you do a last job. Make sure that that windlass has the clutch engaged so that it will indeed work. Third lesson. Do not rig your jack lines to go near the windlass in any capacity. Not over the anchor road. Make sure that you have clearance because the windlass likes to, it has a mind of its own and it will eat anything within its vicinity. The windlass cares less. The windlass cares less. So those are the lessons. Those are it. What happened is, as we got to the roughest part of the um, departure from the Golden Gate, the bar. going across the San Francisco Bar with swells coming in from the west, directly opposing the ebbing tide, seas got rather steep rather quickly. So steep that the uh, the water was coming pretty much over the front of the boat. We call that green water. Hitting the dodger, like I thought. Hitting the dodger. The, dodger. Go off. the force of this water pulled the anchor off of the anchor roller. The windlass, because the clutch was not engaged allow the chain to run free. And so we heard this Gee, Megan, what could that be? Do you hear something? I hear something. So I went up on deck to investigate because we thought maybe there was a halyard that was hitting the mast, something to that effect. I glanced over to the bow roller, absent was the anchor, and the windlass was running free with, uh, with the chain running out rapidly. The uh, first reaction was to take the boat out of gear. NEUTRAL! Megan did her best. She put it in neutral right away without slowing the engine. <laughs> Throttle! <laughs> so at least we weren't going to wrap the chain around the propeller in the steepest seas of the channel that we've ever seen. It's all after Second priority. Stop the chain which is still going overboard. 320 feet of it is all we've got. The chain is still falling overboard. It's like one foot per second. We have like 320 seconds. So we need to engage the clutch. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what I needed, but I knew I needed it fast. <laughs> Winch! Handle clutch! As I'm running back and forth along the deck without my harness tethered to the boat. In the biggest, steepest The waves biggest, waves. steepest waves. You have to follow every sentence with that. <laughs> yeah, that every... The biggest, steepest waves we've ever seen. Oh, we're getting beamed to the seas. Don't forget that. Oh, yeah, the boat is turning itself around because now the, the engine's in neutral. Megan somehow understands what I'm talking about and gets me a winch handle, which is used to engage the clutch on the windlass. 
So I clamber back with the windless handle. No, I did. I went up there and I, hand, I tried to hand it to you and you're like, do it. Oh yeah, I've, I've got my foot on the chain to stop the chain. <laughs> Megan comes forward to engage the clutch. We have no idea which direction Yeah, uh, luckily to go. I didn't like undo it. Megan tightens the clutch and the chain stops. Shook. Okay, Megan, you go handle the helm. I'm going to bring the chain back in. Some. Megan turns on the windlass, <laughs> which has to be turned on from down below. Well, we're in the biggest, <laughs> steepest seas we've ever seen. Okay, the windlass is on! That's Megan talking. Okay, I'm going to bring it up! In the biggest, steepest seas I've ever seen. So, I don't want to stand up. I use my hand on the retrieval <laughs> button. The jack line, which is used to tether the, the body to the boat, which I'm not even tethered to, the jack line follows the anchor road up and wraps itself around the window, the windlass. So now the windlass is stopped, and we're beamed to the biggest seas we've ever seen. We should call it the careless. Megan, I don't think... We need the scalpel. Megan, you couldn't tell what was happening. No. Megan's just responding. Thank God she's not asking me. Why? Thank God we put the knife up. Thank God we have a knife. Or I'd have been giving you the kitchen knife. I scurry back to the cockpit in the biggest, deepest seas I've ever seen. Water up to my ankles. It's washing over the boat. Get the knife, which is no longer in the sheath. So now I have a very sharp blade. <laughs> that I'm trying to get to the bow of the boat uh -oh. in the biggest, deepest seas I've ever seen. <laughs> Finally, I make it to the, to the jack line, which is wrapped around the windlass, and I manage to cut it, just like butter, like a hot knife through butter. That knife is really, really sharp. It's, it's worth the 30 bucks. The whole time, the anchor is dangling below us, like 200 feet. Or 300 feet. We don't We're even only know. In 190 feet of water. We're only in 190 feet of water. Do you think it was in the bottom? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe that's why we turned around. Yeah. No, I turned us around. That took the autopilot off and turned us around. Megan won't give credit to the anchor. <laughs> she turned us around. I, I was trying to turn us, and I was like, why isn't the boat turning? We lost so, the steering. So now it's time to bring in the anchor. And this is, this is about 500 something, 550 pounds of chain, and about an 80 pound anchor. It's all going to come back onto the boat. In the, biggest. in the biggest, deepest seas we've ever seen. And it takes a while. And part of the jack line is still wrapped around the windlass, but I'm just like, forget about it. It's got to come on board. Finally, I get, I'm getting close. And I realize this anchor is going to be swinging like crazy. It comes out of the water, swings as high as the deck, then swings back down and hits the bow of the boat. Thank God Megan hasn't seen the damage yet. And that was our first half an hour outside of the Golden Gate on our cruise around the world. So in summary, as you watch our other videos and assume that we are experts in all of this and we're born aboard and have salt water in our veins just let me remind you that we started small and made a bunch of mistakes one of which is being wowed by the bling don't be wowed by the bling but if you're selling a boat <laughs> if you're selling a boat I'm amazed at the boats you go on board that are for sale sometimes that are not picked up and cleaned yeah. the way they should be. Just keep cleaning that boat. Yeah. Rust stains, get them off. Yeah. Paint scratches. Polish it up. Polish it up. Get everything off the boat. That's what sells a boat for a higher amount of money. It's so true. The one that's been sitting in its slip for a while that's all oxidized and has uh, some rust staining and it's kind of sad. It smells when you come in. 
it's kind of moldy smelling or has a diesel smell, uh, people will not pay a premium for that. Yeah, I think you really have to think of a boat as like a, a person. I mean, mm -hmm. we refer to it as a female and mm -hmm. it's, you, you know, it has a spirit. So it's like the best advice for selling a boat is really treat it like it's a live, living, breathing thing that, you know, is something you want to spend time with. Because yeah. you walk into those sad ones and it's like, oh. It smells I, like a bad dream. <laughs> yeah, it's like kind of haunted. It's kind of haunted by what didn't go yeah. right for the previous owner. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the big takeaway is if you want to sell your boat for uh, the highest amount of money, clean it, polish it, paint it, and that'll fetch. Air it out. <laughs> air it out. <laughs> Top dollar. And that's what a good broker should be doing, too. They should be insisting. Yeah. But it's really surprising. How often you see a boat for oh, sale? Yeah. There's one right across the dock from us at this very moment. Oh, it's an, and it's called Mindful. Oh, honey, don't say that. Mindful might be watching, but it's a it's a <laughs> it's beautiful hunter um, pilot saloon. I think they call it, and it just looks super duper sad. Especially the dinghy. The dinghy's all. <laughs> Our dinghy's looking almost as sad. <laughs> it is. We need a new dinghy. Thingy but you guys. know what I was going to think of, say is when we were looking for this boat in Florida, Fort Lauderdale, we looked at a couple cats and they were so sad. Yeah. They were just like off some, you know, somebody's private dock, totally neglected. Mm -hmm. And that it did, um, you know, they were more expensive because they were in Fort Lauderdale, but yep. they totally scared us off. That scared us off because it's something subliminal. It's something subconscious where you go, well, you know, if they don't make it look nice. They probably haven't been maintaining it. Right. And if they haven't been maintaining it, then it's going to be a bunch of problems. But, you know, what happened to us with our first big monohull is we were so enthralled with the beauty of it that we didn't notice all the things that it lacked. Yeah. All the cruising gear that wasn't there and the condition yeah. of the systems was not really all that good. So, yeah, you can really uh, you can put one over on a couple news <laughs> like us. Anyway, thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks um, for watching. A reminder that we do have a podcast that we do, and right now it's not on iTunes. You have to sign up for it. You get emailed. Uh, we'll change that over to iTunes at some point, I think. But um, basically, it's a kind of a ramble, more of a rambling discussion like this one, but we just can go on and on and yeah. on. That's not a very good selling. Well, I think yeah. on this week's, which oh. we'll, we'll uh, record this tomorrow, once this is all fresh, is talk about either way, which was kind of the middle way. The next book. Yeah. Yeah. Because we, we, Nick wrote a book, uh, Get Her On Board, sort of about low pressures experience. Yep. And a lot I, more details in fact, than just I said this. when yeah. we sold low pressure, that's it. No more boats. And, and that's two boats ago. <laughs> <laughs> So either way is a good story and a very low price uh, of what we bought it for and invested in and the return on it and what we, we had it for eight years. Yeah. So a lot, lot of lessons. Of great yeah. A lot lessons, of lessons. Great there. experiences. All right. Well, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. I see ya. Bye.